All right, so Matthew 7 is just one of those chapters where there's so many examples of verses being misunderstood, right? Because Jesus often talked in ways which are understood by people that didn't understand salvation, didn't understand salvation by grace. So I want to particularly focus on where he talks about the fruit in Matthew 7. And we'll look at that passage. But before I get into fruit meet for repentance or fruits meet for repentance which i believe what uh, jesus is talking about in matthew 7 and what we see john the baptist talk about when he talks about bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance where i get the title of this sermon we need to understand what fruit can be in the bible because some people have a one-dimensional view of fruit and they get an understanding of fruit and they try to apply that to every time fruit is mentioned in the Bible. And if you do, you're going to get stuck because sometimes it's not going to make sense. So what you need to understand in the Bible is that there are different kinds of fruit. And fruit can mean different things. So then you need to understand that there are different things that fruit can be so that you can then use this understanding when you look at passages like Matthew 7 or when you look at passages like Matthew 3 and Luke um, 3 with John the Baptist or when you look at passages like John 15 which we will look at today as, as well when we look at you know the branch that brings forth fruit and what it can mean so there are five types of fruit in the Bible I don't know if you know that five types of fruit in the Bible I'll just go over them quickly the first one is just fruit from a tree the bible talks about when it talks about fruit it can just mean the physical fruit from a tree genesis 1 and god said let the earth bring forth grass the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and god saw that it was good so obviously this physical fruit is the analogy that God uses for spiritual fruit and other fruit. So we can learn things about fruit, looking at the physical fruit and apply that to spiritual aspects or even other fruit like having children, where we think, hey, there are certain environmental conditions that are needed to bring forth fruit. And we looked at that when we talked about, hey, church and how church can be a ground where people grow in and certain things can be applied spiritually, truth, light, you know, water, um, certain uh, dung even, you know, is required for fruit to grow. So there requires a bit of tribulation, a bit of persecution, a bit of conflict for people to grow. So we can learn this from the physical analogy of fruit and apply it to other areas of fruit. Now the second type of fruit we see in the Bible when the Bible talks about fruit is physical children. So we have physical fruit from a tree and then we have physical children. Um, don't think too much about the colors, but I did think, okay, well, a tree is green and physical children is blood. So I tried to make the colors make sense. So we got fruit from a tree and then we have physical children. Let's look at Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Psalm 127, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So you see how there's physical fruit of a tree and then there is fruit of the womb. Sorry, I'm just going to turn this down a bit because it sounds like it's feedbacking. <clears throat> so you have fruit of the womb. So when you think about the, the conditions that are required for fruit to grow, you can also apply it physically when it comes to children. If you think there are certain environmental conditions, you know, a, a woman has to take care of her body if she wants to be able to get pregnant. You know, people sometimes that are overweight or they're stressed or they're not eating right or they're taking drugs can sometimes get miscarriages or sometimes they're not able to carry a children. You gotta think about your environment in your family as well. I mean, if you don't have a good relationship, you know, you're, you're probably not sleeping together very often and things like that. So, you know, you can think about these environmental conditions, um, you know, work that's required, work required in your relationship. 
even patience. You know, children don't just come like that. Sometimes it takes a bit of patience and consistency with your relationship with your wife in order for children to be a result of that relationship. So children as well is referred to as fruit in the Bible. Now, not only are physical children referred to as fruit in the Bible, but physical uh, spiritual children are also referred to as fruit in the Bible. And this is where, you know, people generally don't use these two examples when we're talking about, you know, fruits meet for repentance or bringing forth fruit as a Christian. But the next three is where they do get stuck. So sometimes people will think, well, spiritual children are fruit, so they try and apply it to every time fruit is mentioned. And they say, bring, you know, bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. Are they bringing forth spiritual children, meet for repentance? Well, that's what I, I don't believe that's uh, what Matthew 7 or Matthew 3 is talking about. But fruit in the Bible can refer to somebody's spiritual children in terms of the people that you win to Jesus Christ. Proverbs 11, 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Look at this, and he that winneth souls is wise. So when you can be fruitful and multiply physically by having children, you can also be fruitful and multiply spiritually by having spiritual children, by helping people believe on Jesus Christ. Look at what Paul says here. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Now, I don't believe Paul is saying here that he is their spiritual father. I believe he's referring to Jesus Christ being their one father, but he working with Christ as the, I guess, the female in this spiritual relationship, us being the church, we work with Christ to beget spiritual children. That's why he said to the Galatians that he would travail in birth again until Christ be formed in them because he was trying to make sure that they were saved. Look at what Paul says here in Romans 16. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Eponetus, who is the first fruits of Archaea unto Christ. Why is Eponetus referred to as the first fruits unto, of, uh, of Archaea, Archaea being a place unto Christ? Because he was the first people there that Paul got saved, right? the first fruits. So you see that that fruit can refer to not only physical children, but spiritual children. Now, what other fruit is there in the Bible? Well, you have the fruit of the Spirit. So you can see these, are the, these last three are the ones that people seem to get confused over and misapply. The fruit of the Spirit, and we read that in Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So how do we have the fruit of the Spirit in our life? Well, we need to walk in the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, we will have the fruit of the Spirit. So this does refer to our actions, right? Our outward working, working out our faith. As we, we walk in the Spirit and as we live by faith in the Spirit, as saved believers, this is the actions that get shown. You know, we will have the fruit of the Spirit, um, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, if we walk in the Spirit, as opposed to walk in the flesh. So if you remember when we talked about the two natures that we have, this is what is being described in Galatians 5, the spirit versus the flesh. So we can walk in the flesh and we'll sin or we'll walk in the spirit and we'll do right. So how do we have the fruit of the spirit? Well, Galatians 5 teaches earlier on when we walk in the spirit. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. James 3, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Look at this, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So we see there that fruit can refer to as well the fruit of the Spirit. It can refer to us walking in the Spirit and doing right. So it's not that people are completely off when they say, hey, you know, when they think about fruit and they say, well, fruit can be the way a person lives. Well, they're right in the sense fruit can be a way a person lives, but when we start applying that to salvation, then we start getting into work salvation, which is wrong. 
So we can't misapply these different fruits to teach a false doctrine like work salvation. Now the last one, and this is one that people don't really know about sometimes, which is the things you say are fruit as well. So people know these ones, obviously we know physical fruit, you probably have known these ones already that when you bring forth, you know, be fruitful and multiply physical children. Spiritual children is when we get people saved, we're being fruitful. The fruit of the Spirit people are very familiar with. But this last one, number five, is what people are not so familiar with. People are not so familiar with fruit in the Bible are not just your actions, not just the people you get saved, not just physical fruit, not just physical, physical children, but it's also the things you say. That is bringing forth fruit. Because the things you say can bring glory to God and the things you say can reveal things about you as well. And that's what we see when we look at the fruit of our lips. And as you think about the verses that we're going to address, this really is the key that unlocks the right understanding of those passages. But let's look at the fruit of our lips in Hebrews 13. It says here, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So you see, when you glorify God with your mouth, when you praise God, when you are singing to the Lord and you're praising God, you are being fruitful as well. So this is why it's interesting when people use Matthew 7 to say, well, by their fruits he shall know them. Well, if somebody says they believe on Jesus Christ, that's the fruit. That's the fruit that they're saying that they believe on Jesus Christ, but that's not enough for them. They want the fruit to be something else. We'll go there in a moment. Proverbs 18. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So you see here, there is the fruit of your mouth. And sometimes people have jobs like that, where their jobs are really just talking. You know, where they're not doing physical labor. You know, maybe it's like a sales job or it's a, a cold calling job or something where you have to teach even, you know, where most of your work is the fruit of your mouth, the fruit of your lips, as opposed to your labors. Now, just to again show you here in James 3 the consistency of what you say being likened unto fruit, we can look at James 3. Look at this. Out of the same mouth, proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So the context here in James 3 are sins of the mouth. Right? That's why I had it as orange. Right? The, 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 the tongue can no man tame. But James 3, it says here, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. So we can see here that James 3 is about the things you say. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. Look at this. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine fig? So we see here that the things that you say are likened to a fountain bringing forth two types of water, but it's also likened to a tree bringing forth fruit. And he's saying, hey, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So you see how the what we say is being likened to, uh, to, the, to, to fruit. Can, can, uh, say, so can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. So it's very important that you understand there are different types of fruit as we look at these passages now uh, in Matthew 7, especially because Matthew 7 is used to teach work salvation. Now let's go to Matthew 7. Let's look from verse 15, because this is really the passage that people use when they talk about work salvation, or they talk about assurance of salvation based on works. Often you'll ask people, how do I know, that, how do I know I'm saved? And they'll quote Matthew 7. They'll say, by their fruits you shall know them. Sometimes people will quote Matthew 7. They'll say, you'll know them by their fruits, and they don't even know that it comes from Matthew 7. So oftentimes when you have to debunk or refute somebody's position, sometimes you have to show them in the Bible where it is and then, tell them, and then explain to them what it is, like with John 15. So a lot of them don't know that it's in Matthew 7. And a lot of them don't know as well that the context of this passage as well is the fact that you'll know false prophets. So the primary example in Matthew 7 
is he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, as we go through Matthew 7, you would never ever want to use Matthew 7 as a basis for salvation, a basis for assurance of salvation. Why? Because if your fruits, when they say your fruits are your works, and they try and use Matthew 7 as a basis for salvation, all this is going to do is tell you that you're not saved. Why? Because er even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Look at this. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So I know I've hammered this point home, but you need to understand that anytime somebody goes to a passage like this, where there are two extremes and tries to use it somehow as proof of salvation or evidence of salvation or assurance of salvation, all it's going to do is going to make people doubt. Because if I go to a passage like this and I apply it to myself as a whole and say, well, a corrupt tree brings, cannot bring forth good fruit, but a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. But I bring forth evil fruit. Does that mean I'm a bad tree? No, we have to understand that these are the two natures being talked about, that there is a corrupt tree and there is a good tree. Now, not only that, so let's say, for example, just going, oh, I just wanted to make a point here before I go on, I just forgot this point. Now, when we talk about judging a person's fruit, when it comes to spiritual fruit and judging a person, person's salvation, you can only really go by these two. Right, these are the only two you can go by because obviously you're not going to judge somebody's salvation by the physical fruit. You're not going to judge somebody's salvation by their physical children. And if you're going to judge somebody's spiritual children, obviously you're going to judge their spiritual children by one of these two factors. So you're back to judging this one by one of these two. So really the discussion is, well, which one should apply when we look at passages like Matthew 7? Well, let's say we look at, let's say we applied number four to Matthew 7. You shall know them by their fruit. Now the problem I have with applying your outward appearance to Matthew 7 is it's very difficult to identify a false prophet by their outward appearance. Why? Because false prophets in the Bible often have a righteous outward appearance. I mean, even in Matthew 7 itself, it says, it says beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So how are you going to know a false prophet by looking at their actions on the outside when on the outside they have sheep's clothing? So it's not that a false prophet comes to you in wolf's clothing so you can just easily tell, well, that's a false prophet. No, they come to you in sheep's clothing. They come to you as somebody that's gentle and soft and appears righteous, but inwardly they're a ravening wolf. We see here uh, in other places like in Matthew 23, where Jesus warns us of the scribes and the Pharisees. He's actually condemning them because outwardly they appear beautiful, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also appear... Uh, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Matthew 5, look at what Jesus says here. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So you see here that the Pharisees and, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees, the false prophets of Jesus' day, they didn't appear as wolf. They appeared very righteous. They appeared very godly, but inwardly was what the problem. What they taught was what, the, what was the problem. And Jesus even says here to his followers, he says, hey, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. So he's actually using them as a benchmark and saying, hey, these people actually behave seemingly quite righteous. And if you're going to earn your way to heaven by works, which really what he's saying here is you can't earn your way by works. But he's saying your righteousness would have to exceed to go above and beyond the righteousness of the scribes and 
Pharisees. So it's not that like these people just openly and outwardly were obviously um, false prophets. So if Matthew 7, when it says, you shall know them by their fruits, can you know a false prophet just by his outward appearance, if his outward appearance appears righteous? No, I, I don't believe so. And um, that's why I think when the Bible says, you shall know them by their fruits, it's talking about the fruit of their lips. Now, if I show you here in Matthew 12, Matthew 12, I think this really proves that Matthew 7 is talking about knowing a false prophet by their fruit, meaning the fruit of their lips, as opposed to the fruit of the Spirit, which, you know, they can, they can pretend that they have, and it seems like they have, but really they don't because they're not saved. Look at Matthew 12. This is a really interesting passage, and I think this really nails down what I'm trying to teach you here, which is that the fruit can be what they say rather than what they do. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, what is blasphemy? Blasphemy is a sin of the tongue, isn't it? Because when you blaspheme is when you, when you say something, you blaspheme God. What, what Jesus is talking about here, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, is what they were doing is that they were calling the Spirit of God satanic. So that's what blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is, was when you actually call God's Spirit, you know, the Holy Ghost, satanic rather than of God. So he's saying when you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, that is an unforgivable sin. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, so you see the context here is the things that we say. Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now look at this. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like ye shall know them by their fruits? But what is Jesus tying it into here? The things that you say. The fact that they were blaspheming the Holy Ghost and he says, hey, because you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost, that's how I know, you know, you're a bad tree. Either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil, look at this, speak good things? So you see again, the fruit that he's referring to is the things that they are saying, not the things that they are doing. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So doesn't that remind you of the good tree and the evil tree, the good fruit and the evil fruit? But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So you see how it all ties together. The bad fruit are the things you say, and the things you say are what are going to condemn you on the day of judgment. Now, why is it that the things you say are going to condemn you on the day of judgment? Because you're, what you say is a reflection of the things that you believe. You know, the Bible says, you know, we believe, therefore we speak. That's why you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved, because your, your mouth reflects what you believe in your heart. So that's why when the Bible says, you shall know them by their fruits, well, you know them by the things they teach. How do you identify a false prophet? Because a false prophet is going to teach work salvation. A false prophet is going to teach you can lose your salvation. A false prophet is going to teach these things, and that's what you have to be wary of when you're trying to identify a false prophet. It's not that you identify them by the way they live, because they're going to look like a sheep. You need to identify them by the things that they teach the things that they say. Now, Matthew 3 is no different when we come to John the Baptist. So we're just talking about refuting 
the scriptures that talk about fruit that people often use to either teach work salvation or teach you have to have works in order to prove that you're saved. So we already talked about Matthew 7, showing that, hey, you know, if you had to judge them by their actions, you wouldn't be able to because they outwardly appear righteous. And even in Matthew 12, when Jesus talks about sins of the mouth, like blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, and speaking a word against the Son of Man, he ties it in to the analogy of the good tree and the bad tree. And it being very obvious that he's saying, hey, it's the things that you speak, it's, it's the, the mouth that's speaking, and because out of the good treasure of the heart you say things, and the evil treasure of the heart you bring forth evil things. Now, Matthew 3 is the same thing. You know, I don't believe this is the, you know, when, when John the Baptist is talking about fruits, meat for repentance, it's talking about the things that they do, it's the things that they say. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that the same thing Jesus said in Matthew 12 when he said, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you see how it's the same teaching here? It's the same thing that he's saying here? O generation, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruit, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. So is he saying here, hey, you have to live right to show everyone that you're saved? No, he's saying here, I can t you have to bring forth the saints, com the confession, that you act the profession of believing on Jesus Christ, that you actually have the fruits meet for repentance, the baptism of repentance being believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Acts 19. But we even see it here, verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So you see how it all ties together? What is the fruit? When he's saying, bring forth fruit, meet for repentance, what was the bad fruit that they were bringing forth in this example? That they were saying, hey, well, we're a child of Abraham. That's why we're saved. Right? Think not, and he's saying, hey, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham. To... You know, that's not the fruit, meet for repentance. The fruit, meet for, for repentance, is that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's fruit, meet for for repentance not we have Abraham to our father so that's what John the Baptist is talking about here when he says bring forth fruit therefore meat for repentance and think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So you see how it all ties together. You know, it's not that you have to, you know, take things out of context. No, no, no. The Bible is very clear that there is the fruit of your lips, that the things you say are fruit. He teaches in Matthew 12 as well that the things that they're saying, speaking against the Holy Ghost, speaking against the Son of Man, saying, hey, make sure you make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt because a tree is known by its fruit. And then he talks about, hey, you're a generation of vipers, the things that you say are proving that. The good man says things good out of the good treasure of his heart. So you see how it's all said? And then he says, hey, every idle word men speak and then you're going to be justified by your words and condemned by your words. So that makes sense of Matthew 7 and Matthew 3, where the fruit is the things that we say rather than the things that we do. Now, the last passage I want to hit on, I don't know if this is going to be a short term, and I just want to talk about fruit today. The last passage I wanted to hit on was John 15, and often people struggle with understanding John 15 and think, well, isn't bringing forth fruit, spiritual children, uh, our actions, being fruitful for God? And honestly, in John 15, I don't mind the fruit in John 15 being any of those three. You know, whether it's bringing forth fruit in terms of spiritual children, walking in the Spirit and bringing forth fruit, bringing glory to God, or, you know, saying the right things, and that being the fruit that's being brought forth in John 15. But people get confused because they think, well, if I'm not bringing forth fruit, 
then am I going to be a branch that's cast off and thrown into the fire? So let's just read through it first and then I'll, I'll go through a couple of things that I've underlined. John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. I'll just stop there for a moment because really this is the passage that they'll use to say that if you're saved, you're going to bring forth fruit. Now, whenever somebody uses works as a standard to, 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 to show whether you're saved or an assurance of salvation, the one question you've got to ask is, well, how much fruit then do you need to know that you're abiding in Jesus Christ? Now, if this is a passage that's supposedly showing and teaching this is how you know that you're saved because you bring forth fruit well then my question is well how much fruit do you need to bring forth to know that you're abiding in the vine because you know the standard that that a work salvation person brings forth it's never just you know going to church once confessing jesus christ as your savior you know just doing one thing right in your life no no they want to see a, they want to see a pattern of good works they want to see you in church all the time they want to see you soul winning they want to see you reading your bible they want you to live the sort of christian life that sometimes it takes a long time for a person to get to in order to prove your salvation so this is why it's just some arbitrary bar when people believe work salvation and they they want to teach assurance by works they just set the bar low enough that they can jump over because obviously they want to know that they're saved, so they just set that bar low enough that they're going to, you know, it's, it's always, whenever they say that you have to repent of sins, it's always sins that they've repented of, yeah, yeah, right. right? It's sins that they've repented of, so that they can say, look, I've repented of my sin, I stopped drinking, I stopped smoking, I stopped fornicating, yeah, all the things that you stopped, what about all the things you still do willfully? Have you repented of those things? No, they don't bring those into account because it would destroy that position. And it does, anything that's done by works, cannot be kept completely that's why we're not blessed by god by works we're blessed through faith we don't prove that we're saved by works we don't get saved by works we get saved by believing on jesus christ so that's why to use a passage like this to then say well you need to have fruit to know that you're saved well then how much fruit do i need to have you know why isn't why isn't one fruit enough you know I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So this is where people start to fear for their salvation because they think, oh man, if I'm a branch that doesn't bear fruit, I'm going to get cast off as a branch and he's going to gather me and be burned. Is that what this passage is teaching? Well, let's go through it again and I'll just point out some things that I've underlined so you can see the difference. The first thing you have to understand is the difference between a branch that is abiding in Jesus, that is in Jesus, and a branch that is not in Jesus. And if you read the passage carefully, it actually makes a distinction between the two. You see here how it says, see, because people assume that the branch in verse 2 that is taken away is the branch that's referred to in verse 6, right? If a man night by not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. But are these two branches the same branch? Well, no, because in verse 2, the Bible says here, every branch in me. So you see how this is a branch that is abiding in Jesus Christ. I believe this is a branch that talks about somebody that is saved. And that's why it just says that the branch is taken away. Now, we don't know what takes away means. That could mean that you quit church. That could mean that God, you know, chastises you somehow. That could mean that God removes you from the earth. You know, that the branch is taken away. The branch is useless on that tree, so it's taken away. Now, if something is taken away, if I take something, let's say Simon has a toy, and I take it away from him, 
Where's the toy now? It's with me, isn't it? So you see how if the branch is taken away, then the branch is still with God. Why? Because it's in Christ. The branch is in Christ. Now let's look at the difference in verse 6. Now it's, if a, if a man abide not in me. So you see how there's a difference between the branch that's abiding in Jesus that doesn't bring forth fruit, that's taken away, and then the, the, the man who's abiding not in Jesus Christ. I guess he, he doesn't even really call him a branch on the tree, right? He says he's cast forth as a branch, right? Because if you're not on the vine, I suppose, you're not, not even a branch, I suppose. He's saying here, so if you abide not in Christ, he is cast forth as a branch. So if you're cast forth, where are you? See, yeah, you're away from God, you're being cast out, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So you see the difference between a branch that's abiding in Jesus, that's not being fruitful. Those aren't the branches that are withered away and gathered up and are burned, or cast into the flames of hell. It's the ones that aren't abiding in Jesus are the ones that are gathered up and cast. Now, how do you abide in Jesus? When well, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're abiding in Christ, right? Because you're saved. Just like he says, you're in my hand and no man can pluck you out. That's how you abide in Christ. He's cast forth as a branch. So first difference is the difference between abiding in Christ and not abiding in Christ. So the false assumption here, or the, or the misunderstanding in John 15, is that the branch in John 6, John 15, 6, is the same in John 15, 2, which is not. Because this one is clear that he, the branch is in me and he takes away. And we learn here that you want to be fruitful, right? Because if you're bearing fruit and if you're trying to bring forth fruit, he's going to purge you. He's going to clean you up so that you can bring forth more fruit. Ultimately, God wants a tree that is fruitful. He doesn't want just a pretty tree just with leaves. So we see the difference between the branch in Jesus and the branch not in Jesus. And second, we see the difference between the branch in Jesus that is just taken away as opposed to the branch not in Jesus that is cast forth as a branch and is gathered and they are burned, representing somebody who is not saved. Now the last thing is, what's the difference between a fruitful branch and a, not, and a, a branch that is not fruitful? Well, this is where I see the difference in you now abiding in Jesus, right? Uh, sorry, uh, Jesus abiding in you. So we see here that we want to be a branch that's abiding in Jesus, but when he starts talking about the branch being fruitful, now it's abide in me and I in you. So see, if you want to be fruitful as a Christian, you need to make sure that, you know, not only are you saved by abiding in Jesus, but you need to have the Word of God abiding in you, be filled with the Spirit, be walking in the Spirit in order to be fruitful spiritually. So he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. So yes, first of all, you have to be saved. To bear fruit but also you need to be walking in the spirit you need to be you know have you know uh, you abiding uh, Christ's words abiding in you I am the vine ye and the branches he that abideth in me look at this and I in him so you see now it's both ways as opposed to just one way salvation is one way where Jesus Christ where you abide in Jesus Christ but when Jesus Christ abides in you, that's when you're trying to be fruitful and walking in the Spirit. And I in Him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. So this is having your prayers answered. right? If you're doing what's right and you're praying for the right things, He's saying, hey, not only do you have to be saved to have your prayers answered, but you need to be, you know, having Jesus abide in you. And it's interesting here that Jesus equates him abiding in you and I in him with his words abiding in you. Because why? Because he is the word of God, right? Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, 
so shall ye be my disciples. So I hope that gives you a better understanding of Matthew 7. I hope that gives you a better understanding of Matthew 3 and John 15. That there are different types of fruit in the Bible. You know, you have fruit from a tree, you have physical children that can be fruit. But when, te- when people start talking about how to judge a false prophet or how to judge a saved person or how to judge your own salvation, these are the three that they generally allude to. Now, obviously, you can't judge somebody's salvation by somebody else that you think that they got saved because ultimately you have to judge whether this person is saved by one of these two. And if you have to judge somebody by their works, you know, often people that believe the wrong thing can outwardly appear righteous. You know, just like false prophets can outwardly appear righteous. The Pharisees and the scribes appeared righteous. Often a lot of Catholics and Orthodox who aren't saved outwardly appear righteous. These are decent people in the outward when you just look at them superficially, but inwardly they believe the wrong thing. So the only way you can judge a person's salvation is by what they say, right? Why? Because what they say is the evidence of what they actually believe, right? So this is what you're using to judge false prophets and a person's salvation. So when the Bible says, hey, by their fruits ye shall know them, you can't know by these. You can only know by this. But when the Bible talks about in John 15 about bringing forth much fruit, I don't have a problem with, hey, if you are saved, you abide in Jesus, and Jesus' words are abiding in you, right? You're trying to walk in the Spirit. Then, yeah, the same will bring forth much fruit. You will have fruit of the Spirit. You will have fruit of the lips. And hopefully you'll also get many people saved. So hopefully that clears things up and just makes you a bit more solid on passages like that when people bring those up to you, when they try and question you know, eternal security, question you know, salvation by grace through faith, so that you have a bit more... You know, and, I, and, and as the weeks go on, I'll be covering more verses like this as we talk about work salvation and eternal security. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, we just thank you that as we search your word and we, we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, we can compare scripture with scripture. And as we compare scripture with scripture, Lord, it all comes together. And we can know, Lord, that we're saved. We can, uh, we can know that we're saved by the fruit of our lips. Um, And we can judge other people, whether they're saved, by the fruit of their mouth rather than their works. So I just pray, Lord, that you help us to uh, judge righteous judgment, that we don't judge um, according to the appearance only, but judge righteously. And help us, Lord, to understand these passages. Help us not to be stumbled by false doctrine, by work salvation. And I pray, Lord, um, that, that today's sermon... Um, help people to understand these passages better and to defend the faith uh, of salvation by grace through faith alone. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.